Hi, welcome to the third uh, training session of the Moose framework. In this session, we are going to explore in a bit more detail some core classes that are available within the Moose framework to build compelling missions. So, when I purchased uh, Black Shark 1 in 2012, or was it 2011, uh, I found um, a complete new world, a uh, very compl complicated simulator, uh, very well made, um, and with a mission editor that I started to learn. And I found the richness of the functionality within the mission editor to be quite compelling. But as my missions and the complexity of my missions started to increase, um, I, I always wanted to build uh, more complicated scenarios. And I found that you can really do more uh, beyond the mission editor functionality using the DCS scripting engine APIs from uh, the, the, the simulator. And when DCS World uh, came out, and right now in version 1.5.3 of the DCS World scripting engine, you have quite a lot of APIs available off the shelf that you can use using Lua coding to actually enrich your missions with, with more compelling actions. Um, but while doing that, or while using those APIs, I found there's a huge learning curve learning the scripting engine APIs, because these APIs, there's, there's a lot of them, and you really don't understand sometimes how they are reacting, what inputs they need to function well. Although the documentation was well made, even then uh, it was really trying to find really the, 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 the practicalities of things and to really learn what they are doing. So um, what then happens or what is still happening or what, what people are doing is they started to use those APIs and they are building scripting scripts to actually build or execute more complicated scenarios and to automate for script mission designers um, all kinds of uh, uh, actions or or uh, or mission events yeah examples are the uh, uh, cargo handling or uh, spawning new objects when, when people log on onto the system and when they are entering in, in, in certain regions within within the simulation so um, I've been using some of those scripts myself, but I found uh, that those scripts are sometimes hard to combine building scenarios that you wanted to, to achieve. And there are no standards. Um, the scripts are made and you, you need to really study how to use the scripts um, before so you can use them. Yeah. Um, the third uh, problem that I found is that uh, the DCS scripting engine API set, well, still or can, have bugs which can have a large impact on your code uh, now these bugs are sometimes completely not uh, avoidable but sometimes there's a workaround and building the workaround to avoid the bug may have a large impact on your code um, which is very frustrating and uh, well i went through it myself and i can guarantee you i don't, I don't want to have everybody experiencing this so the fourth point is, and this is a very important point, when you are building missions using the mission editor, then, and you're adding Lua code in your mission, this Lua code can be spread out at multiple places within your mission. Um, these can be in triggers. Um, these can be, uh, you know, in the do script sections or in the do script file sections. Um, they can be embedded within Lua predicates. Or they can be embedded in waypoint actions of groups uh, when a group uh, uh, pr achieves or, or um, approaches a certain waypoint you can actually on that waypoint build or add Lua code uh, that will be executed during the mission the fifth point is that the workflow mechanism of the mission editor is sometimes hard to follow when you're building complicated missions, it's really it's really hard to understand which trigger is going to fire off, uh, having all those uh, flags uh, being set on and off and so on. So um, these five points, I think, are worth to mention. And, and while having these experiences, I thought, can't I make something that allows guys in the community actually to, to use a framework 
something that's available off the shelf that allows you to overcome these five uh, problems or actually try to avoid them. So I got here 10 points, which I think are the more important points. Why I think the Moose framework was being built. And the first point um, is the most important point. Um, Moose framework pr will provide you with Moose with classes, um, predefined logic that allows you to make the Lua scripting more easy for machine designers and it provides you with an abstraction layer. It hides actually the complexity of these APIs here where it can, building more complicated scenarios off the shelf. So you can achieve more with less Lua code written in your mission. It also allows, and this is important, remember here this point, that the coding is spread out over all the different uh, areas in the user interface in your in your mission ed mission uh, editor. So it allows you to condense the code uh, in, within one script file. So you basically can have one file where all your all, all your code is being embedded in, and that includes waypoints, that includes Lua predicates, and that includes triggering mechanisms. Um, Fourth point is really important. The Moose framework is coming with proper documentation. Each method that you can use is properly documented. Where it is needed, an example is provided. And also very important, and it's not written in the presentation, but a proper release mechanism. So Moose is an ongoing development. Um, it needs to guarantee when it can backward compatibility and the release mechanism will uh, is guaranteeing where it can backward compatibility, where it can't, it will be properly communicated to the community where backward compatibility is being damaged. But it will more of more important, it will uh, guarantee that your missions will still be keeping on working on, a, on an ongoing basis. Now, this is a very challenging goal, but uh, I think this is really important to make the Moose framework successful. Um, because the Moose Framework contains such a large, or will contain a larger library of classes. The Moose Framework will provide you with example missions that are that you can download, that you can study how you, to use certain Moose classes and how to build more complicated scenarios. Um, six pointers. Um, these classes can be instantiated into global objects and you can use these objects and the methods of these objects within the also within the various area of the mission file so you can use them also in triggers you can use them in the Lua predicates and you can use them at waypoint actions and I will explain you uh, in a little in a couple of examples how this is done with uh, the, with, with uh, some missions that I've that I've developed um, the seven point while building the Moose framework um, because you you have various classes available, depending on the type of class that you have or that you are using, certain actions will, uh, from a coding perspective, will look the same, but your object behind the action will react different. Uh, examples are, for example, within cargo. So when you are uh, deploying a cargo with uh, real uh, infantry, then you will see visibly the infantry being running around or being entering in your helicopter. But when you are uh, going to collect uh, a package, for example, then you won't see those units, but you will see a, a uh, carrier, kind of a, a unit running, driving to your helicopter to hand over the, the, the package to you. Yeah? So while within your coding, these, uh, these actions will look the same, the actual execution of those actions will differ depending on the type of cargo that you are handling. Um, there are the Moose framework also provides you with multiple tasks that, that you can set up within one mission. So um, the mission scheduler is handling those different tasks and you can have a workflow set up when certain tasks need to be started, to be executed, stopped uh, and, 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 and monitoring the goals or the achievement levels of those tasks is part of the mission, of the mission scheduler as well. Um, the, f the nine point is really important. 
um, it's important that when you are designing missions that you are not within your Lua coding, that you're not developing large repeating loops. A couple of examples are where you, where you sometimes want to iterate, let's say, a set of 500 units to find the right unit that you need. Um, well, well, this is a very condensed coding mechanism. It, it has an impact on performance. You will see during the execution of your mission, when, when that loop runs, you, will, you may see your mission starting to hurtle, starting to, to run into chunks. So the, the Moose framework provides you with classes and sets and databases to actually overcome uh, those large repeating loops and to actually uh, create um, a more uh, performance improved uh, mission. Yeah. Um, and this, the 10 point is also important. So when you're developing your missions, you may want to follow what's happening in your mission. So there are tracing uh, or logging system is embedded within, within the framework that you can activate using uh, uh, switches um, to actually follow within the dcs.log file what is happening in your mission. So I thought these are the 10 points that, that, uh, that I thought are the most important why I started the Moose framework. You can call them the principles of the, of the Moose framework and each class will obey those uh, principles where it can. All right. So let's go in, in a bit more detail right now. So I'm in this uh, third part, I'm not going to explain all of the uh, classes within the Moose framework. For that, we will have different sessions. But in this session, I'm going to explain you some of the core uh, Moose wrapper classes. And wrapper classes are basically um, classes that wrap existing DCS objects within your mission, wrap them up, and provide a richer API set, get more done with less code, and provide full backward compatibility uh, to the existing APIs as well. Um, when you look at the DCS object uh, hierarchy, um, you see that most of the objects are arrived from a class called object, which contains a couple of APIs. I'm not going to detail them. You can find them in the documentation of the DCS World Scripting Engine system, or uh, or Grimes in the in the community also has written an extensive wiki around these APIs. Um, but you'll find that uh, everything is derived from object. Then you got a coalition object, which even adds more APIs to it, and then you got all these classes here a weapon, an airbase, a static object, a unit, and a group, which basically provide their own rich API set to handle these specific objects. For this session, we are going to focus on unit and group. Unit and group, you need to keep in mind that when you want to move objects around, you need to access the controller of the group or the unit to actually create tasks. Yep. So, when you look at uh, how the DCS world uh, scripting engine is working or how the object, the objects are organized, not a surprise, I guess, but let's explain it quickly by example. So imagine if I'm having a group uh, one and a group two running in the mission and I'm having within group one, a unit one, a unit two and unit three. The first unit is a skill excellent, the second is skill high, and the third is a skill player. In group two, I'm having unit four, unit five, unit six, and the first skill is a client, which is a multiple player. Uh, uh, so each client uh, it will provide a slot where players can, which players can enter in the multiple player uh, mission execution. Same here, and here you have an AI unit with a medium skill. Now what does Moose do here? Moose does this. Moose will wrap these DCS objects with wrapper objects. So what, what happens is within your mission is that when group one and group two get alive, meaning there's an instance within your mission running, then Moose will provide you or will create within the mission execution a group one a moose class wrapping all of the blue ones here and it will provide you with a group one moose class 
a group 2 moose class. And the group 1 will have a unit 1 moose class, a unit 2 moose class. Now, what is different already is that because this is a unit 3 has a skilled player, meaning a human being executing or controlling that unit, then that unit will be wrapped by a client class. So it will create a client one class for you here. In the second example, group two, because unit four is a multiple player client, you will Moose will create for you a client two class, a client three class. And a unit three class will be created for the last unit six AI. These wrapper classes are existing in parallel with the existence of the DCS world classes. Yeah? They are actually not containing them, they are referencing those objects. So within group one you'll 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 have the name of the group one embedded in here and each time you call a method the and, and the group one DCS group needs to be consulted then the, the moose class will actually refer using the name the group one uh, object. Yeah, so this is important to understand. Now, what are these classes? Well, the advantages of uh, the object model of Moose is that it takes an abstraction of 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 the complexity of these these uh, handling these 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 units here. Um, create write less code and do more, but also manage the state of these objects. Currently, the unit DCS classes and the group DCS classes cannot contain a state. And what is a state? It's basically, during your mission execution, you sometimes want the unit to remember that it was in a certain state. For example, is when I'm having a helicopter and it's picking up cargo and it landed, I want to have that unit having a state, I am picking up cargo. So that in another event somewhere, I can inquire that unit and say, in which state are you in? Oh, you're picking up cargo. So I know exactly what I need to do, right? And this is a, one of the more powerful aspects of the Moose framework. By these wrapper classes, they can contain the state. So they have methods available that allow you to create, uh, to actually embed states into the, uh, into the objects, yeah? And then, of course, the logging mechanism, so you can follow the unit's uh, behavior where you want and also improve uh, the performance. Remember, avoid large, long-lasting loops um, and react on events when they happen. Um, everything is derived in Moose from the base class. And the base class is a very small class, but it does the core function of the Moose framework. Each class here, when you instantiate using the constructor, a new class, it will actually handle the core mechanism of inheritance. It will create the instance and it will also facilitate the logging mechanism um, that, 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 you, that each class has. So um, this, this, this base class here contains functions to actually log your logic within your within the dcs.log file using parameters the unit class which which uh, embeds the dcs unit uh, object so for each unit you'll so for each dcs unit that is alive you will have one unit wrapper object from moose and the unit class of moose is supporting all the DCS unit APIs available, backward compatible, but it also provide, will provide you with APIs that are not within the DCS unit API set. An example is, for, is for example, you will uh, not have get give me the height, okay, the the height of a certain unit that is flying around within the mission, and I and you found people you find people duplicating cord or, or using mist for to retrieve the height. Now, within Moose, because you have your unit object here, you can just call the method of that unit 
object here to retrieve the height and done yeah very simple um, it also provides an abstraction to the local unit controller so if you want to move the unit individually uh, and do a certain task then you have to access the controller while the unit class will provide you with apis to control that uh, without having to access the controller um, the client wraps the yeah the again a dcs unit object but there where a player can join the unit which is different behavior because clients will communicate with players using the mes messaging system it will also have multiple uh, facilities to handle cargo it will have um, certain skill level settings um, it will it needs to monitor whether a client is alive or not i mean not each client is alive within a, a multiplayer mission only when the player joins the client then it then the unit will become alive and so on and so on so there are specific apis here that are more richer than the normal ai unit uh, class behavior group group uh, is containing units or clients and again wrapping supporting all the group dcs apis available today here but providing a richer api set that is not available within dcs take an abstraction of the group controller perform ai tasks set options and so on and so on and control the group movement right so how do these uh, wrapper classes get created within moose now fortunately the creation of these wrapper classes are done for you automatically and they are registered within a global object within your mission that is available uh, called a database within moose there's a database class and automatically during the mission start uh, the a database object is being created with the name underscore database that database is containing all wrapper classes that are required of all the DCS objects that are available within your mission. And during mission execution, it is monitoring in the background each new object that is being spawned within the mission, and it will create for you automatically a wrapper class of that DCS object. So for example, when I'm having I'm running my mission and a new group is being spawned with four units then the database will create for you automatically four wrapper unit objects and add them to the units collection here and will create one group wrapper object and will add it to the groups collection here. The uh, collections are retrieving the, uh, the relevant objects using the name of the wrapper class or actually the name of the, of the group. Yeah the DCS group so um, the database is providing with an API set to actually consult these collections here and this is really working very simple using the following uh, uh, method so each time you, you want to retrieve um, the collection you actually within your mission trigger uh, logic you can use the APIs here Within the group way, waypoint actions uh, that you have in your mission, you can actually consult the APIs and even Moose itself is using the database to actually consult these collections. Now, which functions or which methods are being used to do that? Now, basically what you have is you have um, the database object that has multiple find and then the class uh, name methods so you'll have a find group method you have a find unit method and you have a find client method and each method is retrieving a string with the name of the object that you want to retrieve yeah so when for example if you have um, in your mission a group one dcs uh, group that is alive you want to retrieve it you will call database double point find group between brackets group one and it will retrieve for you the wrapper class 
Having the wrapper class will then allow you to do the, use those APIs of the wrapper class to do the rich things. Now, this may not become really very handy. So, as a second method, um, each class has find methods available. So, you have basically two. You have, if, you, if you're in a certain stage, and this is, becomes really important when you're building in the mission editor a waypoint action, then you can use the find and it, it takes as a parameter the DCS group uh, reference and you can use that to actually get the reference of the relevant wrapper uh, object in the groups collection of the database or you can do similar as in database give the name of the of the group similar for unit and similar for client now let me show you a few examples how this is working, yeah? Okay, let's start with a very simple demo um, using wrapper classes within Moose. So I got a group of four tanks sitting there in a test mission. The test mission has nothing around, it's just these four tanks within the mission that are just sitting there and waiting. So let me show you the tanks name. So we got a smoke test that we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to fire off from certain units within that group a smoke. And I'm going to show you how to use the unit wrapper class to do that and the methods around the unit wrapper class. So each unit within the group has a name, proper name, which is important because remember you need to find the unit uh, wrapper class using the name of the unit within the mission. So we got a smoke test one here, we got a smoke test two, smoke test three, smoke test four. Now let's have a look at the code. If, if DCS allows me, yes, fine. So here we are. Uh, we have, for, 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 for speeding up this demonstration, I have already written these four lines. And basically, as I, I explained in the presentation, um, the database object is being consulted which contains the units which were automatically filled so I'm going to retrieve a, a unit uh, class instance taking using the method find unit and giving as a parameter the name of the DCS unit that I would like to retrieve I'm gonna type this for you in um, let me delete this I'm gonna type it for you and I'm gonna show you how the intelligence of uh, the Eclipse editor is working and helping to do that. So I'm doing a unit tank AI4 equals data. And now look what I can do. I can do control space. And it will say, okay, I know this. I know there's a database object within your 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 uh, development environment. So when I have database here, I press double point and it will show me the functions that are behind database. So I can browse up and down. I can go to a function, for example, at client, what does it do? Ah, okay. Create event birth, what does it do? Yeah, and everything is documented Maybe not in database yet, but it will in the near future. Uh, so the function that I'm interested in here is, as I explained, find uh, unit. So find unit. What does it say? Finds a unit based on the unit name. Parameter, a string, give me a unit name. And it will return a unit class with the found unit. Great, that's what we want. So I'll select that. Now it's asking me, give me then the unit name, which I can just provide here. Voila, done. So if we execute this, what, what you need to do is, I've created this file, moose test wrapper, which I'm storing at a certain place, actually here within the, mission, within the moose directory structure here. So now I'm going to refresh in my, in my triggers 
in the mission. I'm going to refresh that mission scenario logic here so that it gets properly loaded within my mission file. I press save and I can play prepare mission. Let's have a look what it does. Basically, it won't do a lot. No? But remember this, what I explained in the first part, the log expert logger. It's fantastic. It trails the logging and you see DCS starting up and it shows you the output that is being logged in DCS.log file. The DCS.log file, just for those who haven't seen part one, quickly explain where to find it. So you'll, you'll have to find it here under your user directory. Go to saved games. Sorry, I'm, I'm Flemish Dutch. Then go to your DCS directory, go to logs, and you'll find your DCS log file here. And you can open that in Log Expert with the file open. And it will stay open. It will save the files open in your preferences. And the next time you start Log Expert, it will automatically load DCS.log as well. Now, by now the mission has been loaded okay now i would like to fly and as i said it isn't doing much um, it's just sitting there for tanks now for for sake of clarity i would like to see what moves it in the background so here what it did is it loaded the classes great and it started to register you see these lines here? This is basically what it says here. It has registered groups. So it has registered a unit smoke test 1, a unit smoke test 2, a unit smoke test 4, and a unit smoke test 3. And it has registered... So, yeah, sorry for me. Uh, sorry, I should explain more. Register group, and I will have to rename. This is actually registering the templates. So. Um, Moose will scan for each unit being defined within the mission, alive or not alive, and it will store all of those within an internal table that I haven't explained to you, but this is important for internal working uh, of Moose. But this one here, Register Database, this is where the group got registered and its units underneath, and they're alive. So you got within the group's collection, yeah, you got the smoke test, and within the units collection, you'll find smoke test 1, 2, 3, 4. Great. But it hasn't really done much. It's not really exciting. So let's go back. I'm going to show you. Let's let's smoke a unit. Yeah, a smoke. So let's, let's uh, fire off a smoke on tank AI 1. So, how do I smoke? Well, there must be a method somewhere, right? That says smoke. And yes, there is. Of course, I know these methods out of my head because I made them myself. But you'll learn the API set of the classes as you use Moose. Yeah? Um, so, what I'm doing here is I'm smoking tank AI1. I'm smoking it blue. Let's smoke another one. AI3. Let's smoke it. You see, I can do this. I, I do double point. And I can just type. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why, but smoke orange. Yeah. Note that I've defined all these things. And remember, the principles of Moose was to, to do a lot with less code. So this function here is just a call. And there's a lot of complexity behind this call. Let me show you what it does, really. Yeah, so it does a trigger. And it does this. Get me the vector of where I where this unit is at. And the vector gets the unit and then calls the get position, double trace, return the unit, blah blah blah. So there's a lot behind these methods here. Yeah? But at the end, you as a user, you will only use this method and to smoke a tank. So, let's have a look. Again, refresh the mission scenario, the mission file, and let's play. Alright. 
So here we are. See this? Tank 1 and tank 3 are smoking. Fantastic. Now, that's great. So now let me show you as well some of the tracing functionality. This is also very important. You need to understand this. So tracing works with, uh, you can activate tracing per class. So basically when you're using unit classes, which is implicitly done here, I can use the base static function trace class to actually activate tracing for the unit class. And you need to give that as a parameter, as a string. So when you've got the unit class tracing enabled, what I can do now is I can use the object unit tank AI2 dot. And look here, as I said, the unit inherits from base. Let me show you the presentation. You may have forgotten, but uh, yeah. So let me go quickly to the presentation again. Remember this? So in the R hierarchy, unit derives from base. So every method that's been defined in base is available for unit. Same for group and even more. Client derives from unit. So every method uh, of base and unit will be available in client. Okay, you can see this in the Eclipse uh, intelligence because it shows you you know that unit and base functions are available okay so now I'm going to show you how to trace so trace is actually an acronym T and, and the reason why I've done that is because I'm using tracing a lot so I've just created a method called T that is being used to trace there's a level you got trace level one trace level two trace level three um, I will explain this on a later session really devoted to tracing but for the moment I'm just using T level one and then I, it needs arguments so fine so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call unit tank AI2 and I want to know what is the ammunition of that tank Here you go. Let's try this out. So again, I need to reload it. Fine. And play. Let's have a look in the in the tracing. What happens? Um, I can't see the login because it's stupid. I hate that. Okay, so now we're on line 16. So here in the logging, the first row, these numbers, they show the line number where the tracing was fired. So within line number 16, I got unit class 05, uh, giving me now the ammunition description of tank 3 which is a structure. Very complicated stuff in there. But this is um, what, what, how Moose helps you to create shorter code. Okay. Okay. Remember, I've retrieved the unit wrapper class using the method from the database. But as I explained in the presentation, there was also a second method. And that method was to use the class static function find or find by name. The first method for unit would be to find um, the unit wrapper class using the given DCS unit instance. Yeah? Or providing a string with the name of the unit. Let me show you in the in the demo how that works. 
So let me change tank number three. Instead of using find unit from the database, I'm going to use the static function. Unit, double point, and look here. I pressed unit and I get all the functions from unit. Yeah. Now I want to do find by name. Here we are. And this will work as well. So I've just retrieved unit number three, smoke test three, using the unit find method. Same thing. Really depends how you would like to use those functions. Uh, I prefer to use the class uh, find method or find by name method because it, it uh, shows more visual what you're doing. While the database access methods are really, uh, its initial purpose was really to, to make them available for internal Moose class development. Okay. Let's get to something more interesting. What I'm going to show you now is how the group can be controlled. And uh, as a small demo, I'm going to create a, a Russian tank. Uh, target. I'll call it target test. And let me make an unarmed or a transport or something. Uh, let's have a look. This one is a nice one. Yeah. I'll put it here and I'll put the options um, saying rules of engagement, weapon hold. Same here. Rules of engagement, weapon hold. Okay. So let me test this. So as you can see in the mission, the tanks are standing very nicely next to each other, the Americans and the Russians, and then are shooting at each other. Perfect. What I'm going to do is I'm going to activate those American tanks using a group function, and I'm going to ask them to fire to the uh, transport the Russian transport and I'll show you how to code that all right so let me show you how to code this the first thing that we'll need to do is to set up a local variable that contains a group wrapper yeah so let's call it group tanks and I'm going to retrieve it from the database using the group static method find by name and our name of our group was uh, smoke test. So right now I have the wrapper of the of the DCS uh, group smoke test assigned to group tanks. Great. So now I can use group tanks and do some functions. Now you see here a massive amount of functions, and the reason is because you know, groups contain a lot more functionality to, to control it. I'm not going to explain every function, but I'm just going to demonstrate what you can do with, with a wrapper class group. So, for example, what you can do is you can say uh, weapon free. Yeah, very simple. What I've done now is I ask the group to fire at will. Let's have a look how that works within the mission. No, I've made a small mistake. Option return on engagement open fire is the right API uh, to be used for ground units. Weapon free is not working. Uh, it's really confusing. Let me explain you because when you go here and you do the options, it says weapon hold, but it says here weapon free. But the real action when you use the Lua scripting environment that you need to use is open fire and uh, this is why I'll show you here the function so it's open fire that is made available for use yeah 
But you see the difference in the Lua scripting environment. You have to use this call, while in the wrapper using the wrapper clause, the only thing you need to do is this. Yeah? So it's much more easy. Now let's have a look how the DCS uh, simulator is handling this little test here. So here we are in the mission. Let's start it up. And as you can see, smoking is happening. Great. And they say, okay, the Russians are nearby. Here we go. All right. What we haven't done until now is moving around uh, groups. So uh, let me show you how you do this. Um, basically, in, in the mission, um, as a demo, I've installed here a command post. And when, when they're done with uh, the Russian attack, I want them to drive to the command post. And you can do this very easily with a, a very simple function. Um, can I show you? So first we get the command post. Again, find the unit by name. And then there's a, a, a method, uh, command post, get point vec2. Yeah. Get point. Point is really uh, from a naming convention. It is a point within the simulation space um, that uh, can be given in, in a 2D or in a 3D dimension. Uh, which is different from a position because a position from a naming convention would be that it includes the direction vectors and the uh, and the orientation vectors so we most of the time work with points so get point vec2 i'm putting the, that point so what it will return is uh, it will return an x and a y uh, coordinate and it will put that uh, in, in this variable so i can trace this and then what I can do is I can create a, a task. So groups have different functions. So let me show you the, quickly the group tanks. Um, so group tanks, double point. And you can see here there are tasks, different tasks here. All kinds of different things that you can create what it will create for you is a structure um, actually a, a, a task structure that is then given to to this function push task okay so the task root to vec2 is basically very simple it says group tanks drive to this point and then uh, with a speed of 20 and then um, for, for example, I'm tracing the structure of the task root, and then I can push this task onto the queue for him to execute it within after two seconds. All right, let me show you how this works in the simulation. So now you can see, as we said before, they smoke. Now they move around a bit, and it's very important to know that when you smoke in a, a unit, the smoke will keep on burning on that position where it was. Now, if the unit moves, then the uh, smoke will continue to burn on, on that old position. It will not move with the unit. This is important. And this is a characteristic of DCS. You can't move really smoking uh, positions, which is a pity, actually. Right. So now they're done. They killed it. So now they're going to drive to the command post. Right. There. There we go. He's doing it very nicely. Um, so, what I'm trying to say is that when combining these APIs, you can create uh, very nice patterns of actions that you can do, and the combinations are endless, really. Um, the group and unit wrapper classes and the actions be behind they are still in development, so it could be you want to have a function that is not available or you want to do something that is not available. What I suggest you do is that you then post your requirement either on the GitHub uh, Moose development site as an issue or you post it on the Eagle Dynamics forums um, so that uh, we can pick it up and we can discuss together what you want to achieve and, and how to do that.
Yeah, and we can work on it together. No problem. Okay, so this is it. Now I'm going to move forward quickly to another demo, and that is really um, how you embed these global variables um, here. How you, how you embed the variables of the group tanks and the units and so on into the mission editor here in the trigger area. Or in uh, Lua predicates or in waypoints. The first thing that you'll need to do is when you want to embed uh, these uh, wrapper objects within your within your within triggers in the mission editor, you need to make those variables global. So you, you just ensure that you're not using local because then the variable will be limited to the script only that you have here in front of you. So I've collected four, five units, so these units and then this one. I also collected a group, I'll make that global as well. There you go. And now I'm going to do this code here, I'm going to execute as part of a trigger. Yeah. So I'm going to remove this, oh. I'm going to remove this here. I'm going to add it as part of a trigger, which I'll do once uh, here we go. I'll let it run, let's say after I don't know uh, time more no, time more ten seconds, fine. And I'll do a do script. I'll have to re-include um, the script file, the mission, because I deleted the logic and I changed the local variables to global variables. Let me just if I let me just check just quickly if I saved it. No, I didn't. So uh, fine. Let me redo this. Um, Okay, let's play. So, yeah, the logic is working. And we killed it, fine. And as you can see now, the logic is working. They're driving to the command post. And this is now executed as part of a trigger instead of within one, in this one script file. Which is really neat especially for beginning scripters um, you can really use the trigger mechanism of uh, dcs world to make uh, scenarios and workflow of different units or groups driving around uh, entering zones and leaving zones and so on yeah so i hope this helps i'm now i'm going to demonstrate another kind of uh, mission editor embedded logic and that is how to implement actions using waypoints so in order to show you how to embed uh, these uh, moose objects into waypoint actions i've i will let the command post move around within the mission um, and when i click on waypoint number one and i want to execute an action there i'll just do perform command uh, run script Right, and I'm just going to copy the same code that I had uh, within the trigger thing. I'm copying the same code here. Okay. Now, when I go to waypoint two, I can do the same. I'm copying the code, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you another command, something really nice, and that is. Um, the waypoint action gives you a parameter. It is given in form. It is given uh, as three dots, and it represents the group that you are executing uh, the waypoint action for. It, just to remind you, it is the DCS group, not the group wrapper class that is given. So you want to ensure that you have the group wrapper class, and remember that 
you had a group uh, static method called find remember in the in the presentation find and i can give here that dcs group as a parameter and what it will do it will uh, retrieve uh, from the database the dcs group it will put it in a global variable command group and then i can uh, get the unit in a different way i can do maybe like this unit find command group get dcs unit one there you go now let's see how that is working so to speed up the demo a bit i've just uh, changed the waypoints a bit to make to put them closer uh, to each other otherwise it will take too much time so let's play. All right. Let's speed up the time and let's show you the view. Here you go. You see now the group is driving to the position where the, where the command post was as it was programmed within the trigger. The command post is driving to waypoint one. Um, so once the command post reaches waypoint one, there are, the group is driving to waypoint one. And once the command post is driving to waypoint two, the group is driving to waypoint two. There you go. And this really demonstrates the different APIs, how to find group, how to find unit, and how to embed the um, moose objects, wrapper objects, within your mission editor. And you can really make compelling uh, logic uh, doing that. Yeah. Now, the, the one thing that we haven't really demonstrated is client. And I'll show you quickly what you can do with client. There's some really nice features in there as well. Okay. So, in order to demonstrate the client wrapper class i have created within the test mission a new group of a k50 helicopters on the usa side the helicopter will fly at an altitude of 200 meters 20 kilometers per hour slowly towards the point number three where the command post is driving to so you will be able to uh, experience the, the events from the helicopter cockpit uh, the group driving to the command post and the command post driving uh, to waypoint number three. Um, in order to uh, ensure you, you completely understand, let me explain to you that a client is basically a unit within a group with skill level client or with skill level player. Client is for multiplayer purposes. Player is for single player purposes. The client class will work for both uh, skill levels. Yeah. So when the mission starts, the as with groups, as with normal units, Moose will scan the mission if there is any client declared within your mission. And it will create for you within the database, underscore database, a client wrapper class object. And that object you can then look up with a find by name or a find function of the client class okay um, so you'll always have to look up the respective client using the name of the unit now let me demonstrate to you how this works within the scripting environment so what i'm going to create now is a global variable client uh, client heli for example and I'm going to say that is a client find by name. And there are two functions here. You can see because client inherits from unit, the unit is also listed. But we'll take the client one here. So 
Now I need to give as a string the client name, which is the name of the unit. So I do client test one, and I can give as an optional parameter a briefing. And I'll show you immediately what that does. So here I do uh, fly slowly to waypoint three of the command post. Voila. That's it. Um, there's not much going on, but I'll show you what happens within the mission. Yeah. Of course, I'll have to reload the, rep the script again, save it, and play. So within the mission, I had created two clients, and now when I'm starting up the mission, I see these two clients nicely listed. I'm going to select client number one. So now when we join the helicopter, client, we start the mission, we're in the helicopter, and here's the briefing. Fly, fly slowly to waypoint three for the command of the command post. So something more advanced is what we can do now is we can ask uh, the client to display a message. So when I execute the trigger, when I start to move the ground troops to the command post position, I want to send a message to the client. So I'm using client heli that I declared globally, remember, here, yeah client heli I want to send a message that um, the group is moving to the to the command post position and I do this by message moving to the command post displayed for 10 seconds an ID of the message moving and title reporting at waypoint one so once the command post is moved to waypoint one, we execute the waypoint script of the command post. I want to send another message to the helicopter saying moving to waypoint one. So indicating that the group is moving there. And at waypoint two, exactly the same thing. Now before we execute the message, let me show you in the editor because the mission editor doesn't really show you uh, in intelligence. So what, what you really what it really does is client heli double point message. These are the parameters. And you can look at the documentation here. Yeah, it's all displayed here in the intelligence. So I can display a message. Now this is the message here. The message will be executed immediately when I retrieved the the client heli uh, ID. So I can say found it, I found client test one. Let me display this for one second. Okay. Message ID, found message category, uh, found, uh, or let's say test for the moment, just a test message. The message interval is not of relevance, but still complicated for the moment to explain. Okay, let me show you the demo quickly. So the mission has started. I'm selecting the first slot. And immediately we should see this, this, this found message. Here you go. Three seconds later, reporting moving to the command post is displayed because that's what I asked the units to be done. I'm going to delete the the um, blue IDs on the screen of the units. I'm going to show you from the cockpit what is happening there. And I'm going to speed up a bit. So you see the unit going, you see the other units, the group going to the command post position. There you go. They're arriving. And there you go, moving to waypoint one. And then once the command post has reached waypoint two, 
moving to waypoint two. Here you go. And this is all viewable from your helicopter cockpit. So not a rocket science really. Um, now you've seen these messages being displayed when the group is uh, doing an action on the ground, but you really want to have the group uh, also communicating that this that group that is executing that action. And uh, for this reason, uh, there is another API that we can use to do this a bit more efficiently. So instead of using the client heli object to send the message to the player, I want to actually, what I can do as well is there's a message method in, in the group class as well. And look at this. You can send a message, a normal message to anybody. You can send a message to all. You can send a message only to the blue coalition, to the red coalition, or to a client. Let's select this one. So now I can do the following. you are away okay duration let me do this five seconds or something and here now I can give the client as a parameter so I can give here client heli as a parameter all right um, same thing on the mission um, let me copy this quickly and the mission during the running I can uh, do this at the waypoint. I can replace this and I can say we are moving to waypoint one. I can copy this again. I can put it here in the second waypoint and say we are moving to waypoint two. All right. Another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to display it a bit more like this so that it gets a bit more a better view from the cockpit. All right, um, maybe a bit more from here. Yeah, and let's play. Okay, so we're back into the cockpit flying here you see the AAV7 now saying hello we are reporting to you our way the AAV7 again we are moving to the command post and it will be the first unit of the group uh, that is reporting so the type of the first unit will be displayed let me delete the these uh, IDs from the screen for you and let's have a quick look on how this further works so you see them moving over you see the command post driving to waypoint one once they join to waypoint one you, you see the message displaying we're moving to the other zone and then yeah further on waypoint two you see because you don't really have sometimes the view of, of your unit so this is a nice feature to report to players uh, the progress of units within a mission. Now, the last demo that I'm going to do is the following. Um, you, some, you want to sometimes to check when a client gets alive, meaning when a client, when a player joins a, a client slot, you only want to display this message when this happens, right? And the way how this can be done is uh, by implementing a local function that will be called within your script when that client gets alive. And the a API to be explained uh, is a bit more complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, one of the missions that I'm having. Uh, for example, uh, the Gori Valley mission. I think here I had some script and there's an API called Alive that I will just search for you in the script. Here you go. So what it does is, so this is a you know more complicated mission. 
So when this client gets alive, so when a join when a user joins this client slot, this is the name of the client by the way with the mission, then the function escort su25t underscore baseline will be called with a client ID number one saying this is the, the first client. This function here you can define locally within your mission and the syntax is really you need to do local function, the name of the uh, function and then two, one actually two parameters here. The first parameter is automatically provided which is the client wrapper class that is given to you and the second one I asked him to send the client number which is given here yeah, and then you can do whatever you want within this function here I am establishing an escort yeah uh, I'm spawning um, an escort and I am establishing the escort here yeah, with, with some description the, you can refer to the escort uh, functionality by looking at the videos regarding escort but here we are going to do something else what I'm just going to do quickly I'm going to copy this function into the wrapper class just to make it more easy for me here you go I'm going to change very quickly the name I'm going to say here client alive function I don't need yeah, I'll, I need the client number. I'll just keep that for the moment. I'm going to delete all of this because I don't need it. And now within the function, I'm going to execute this. Now, of course, it won't really uh, work yet because I need to remember the client wrapper class is given as a parameter. So I just need to use that parameter here, client. It won't really do anything yet until I ask him when you're alive, here you go, I, I, I need to call that callback function that I just made with all, and I can give variable amount of parameters. So I say here, please call client alive, the function that I had, and say this is client number one. Okay? I hope you understand what we're doing here. Um, now, for the sake of demo, I can do the same, and I can do here client heli2. Client heli2 has a parameter. So, when, so, what I'm expressing here is, I'm establishing a new client wrapper class. I'm finding the wrapper class using the name client test2, which is the second uh, slot. And when I join this client, I will get those reports as well because I will be alive here. We are reporting to your way and I can say here hello client ta -ta -ta, client number ta -ta -ta. hello client 2 yeah we are reporting to you on our way on our way that's proper English I'm not native English, by the way. So this should work, I think. If I don't have an error somewhere, what's the error that is given? No error. Oh, I have three dots here. Okay, done. So let's play. And let's have a look how this is working. So I will join the first slot and I want to see the hello message, but a different one. Here you go. Hello client one. We are reporting to you on our way and the groups will report to client number one. Yeah. Now, when I join client number two, I want to get hello client number two. There you go, a briefing and hello client number two. We are reporting to you on our way. 
So what the alive function does is something really nice. When you when a player joins a client, you can execute a function that you define yourself with logic that you define yourself on a dynamic basis, right? And um, also notice that uh, when I'm flying in the client number two in the group, uh, that the reports will not be arriving to client number two because I'm only asking to report to client number one. Yeah, the client heli, not the client heli two object I was using in the waypoint actions. So you see nothing appearing right now. There you go. If I would like to report my actions as well to waypoint to client number two, I will have to uh, add on those waypoint actions the same message, but then use client heli two. Yeah, this object here. This one. Yeah. So. I hope you found this really interesting. Uh, there are many more functions uh, available. And let's take some time to go over these functions, maybe a bit more in detail, uh, just verbally uh, browsing through the documentation. So I'm, I'm going to explain this quickly, because this is a long video, and uh, you, you really should look at this yourself, uh, looking at the documentation. But basically, the unit class as a wrapper class, it has unit reference methods, find and find by name as explained. So when you click on it, you see the descriptions of those in a bit more detail. Um, it has DCS unit APIs, meaning the current APIs available within DCS are, most of them are available uh, in the wrapper class as well. But just make sure that you, that you understand that the first letter of that function has been capitalized. So if I would browse to DCS unit, unit get name, then the first G is a lowercase. I have capitalized that to a, a capital G. And this is mostly done. So when I go to DCS unit, you see all these units uh, descriptions here, like get group and get ID and get life. When I go to unit, You'll see in the same functions, more or less, yeah. Get coalition, get call sign, get live, get ID, but with a capital G. Um, that's one. Second is there are some additional APIs available, and this long list here you won't see uh, the roots between the trees. So what I've done is give a small manual here which APIs are available. Um, smoke, yeah, so you can smoke units using smoke blue, smoke green, smoke orange, blah, blah, blah. You can flare them, same things, flare red, flare green. <clears throat> you can obtain positions of units uh, in two dimensions, in three dimensions, using a VEC2. And by the way, the VEC2 is properly documented here. You can uh, get a three dimension vector. Um, and this is really important to understand. When you do get point vector, the naming convention in Moose is that the point gives you back the location of the unit without any other properties. You can do this in 2D or 3D. So it basically provides you a vector with an X or a Y when it's vector, or a VX, Y, Z when it's a 3D uh, point. But the position is something more complicated, and I'm following the, the, the DCS naming convention. The position is really, wait, that's not working, should be really all the vectors. So not just the location, but including the direction vector and the orientation vectors uh, of that unit. And I make sure that I'll, I'll make sure that this is uh, properly documented on a later stage. Fine. Alive. So there's a unit. Uh, is alive, is active uh, uh, method. So here, um, when when this returns true, that means that the unit is alive and active. Fine. There are some other functions like, is the unit in the radius? So is there another unit within the radius of the unit that I'm having? And so on. And as Moose will be developed, more functions will be added, and I'll make sure that when there's a nice function that it get properly documented here. Um, so 
same thing is for groups um, for groups I for the moment I have not documented all these things but I make sure that the same kind of documentation standard is being used so you see here quite a lot of functions and it's really a lot of work to document all of these things and I'll just play around with it today but I'm already going to publish the video because I think a lot of people will be interested in this um, and during the, the next couple of days I will just document group as well as I have done unit same thing for client uh, yeah lots of functions there as well let's go back to group let's walk quickly over it I'll explain a bit verbally what's in there so the major advantage of group is that you can execute tasks here without really having to understand how to build task structures which is uh, something like this so when you go low level into DCS you have tasks here and you get all these these um, all these structures here which is kind of a pain to learn so what I've done for you is I've kind of built API's wrapping these structures here yeah and you can get then the API's with the parameters that are expected uh, as, as an input so when I go for example to the task of group um, let me show you here orbit so I can say you know orbit make me a task orbit circle at vector at a vector 2 so I'm giving a point I'm giving an altitude and I'm giving a speed and the group will fly to that point and will orbit in a circle around now as you can imagine it will be a lot of work to make for each function and each task that's available a, a an API and gradually this will be completed but for the moment these are the tasks that I've already made and the reason why these are there is because I've been creating those in, during my mission design but I guess bombing would be a very nice task to be added um, yeah as you can see here there are many more task types that are available attack group attack unit yeah attack map object bombing the runway so when I have time and when I have really time and, and time is limited I will add more tasks to it if you need another task so if you want to use moose and you say I want really this task to be added let's discuss it together and I will program it for you and I will add it for you yeah so that you can use it um, so you see a lot of work being done here the second is you also will have uh, certain options that you can set uh, like hold fire open fire return fire uh, so you can really control the group uh, attacking behavior with that the message as I explained are here there are certain API's like is the group in the air is the group an airplane uh, group a ground group or a helicopter group or a ship group is the group alive this is an interesting one what does it mean alive well, when um, so when there's one unit within the group that's alive then that group will return real life yeah the size so it's really looking at the API set currently available and learning it and using moose and going in it and you will find sometimes an API that's not available so I'll repeat when you have the situation please email me or uh, or join the slack.com moose uh, chat box or just post on the forum in the relevant uh, moose uh, thread your requirement and we can discuss it together or send me a private message that's also working um, so I hope you found this interesting and uh, I will add on the video the exact location where you can find this documentation because currently I'm just browsing it locally but basically it should be at the central moose documentation site and you should be able to find it quickly once I have released this all this code so thank you and see you next time bye bye